Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of the Science of BS. Brand systems. That's right, <laughs> brand systems. And this week, we want to cover the relationship between brands and their sales teams and how both can't live without each other. And we have a very special guest for this opportunity. I just learned about all this sales magic. And then uh, thanks a lot to this guy, Brian Felker, who just joined our team. Brian, so excited to have you on this. Hello, I'm excited to be here. Now, I'm, I know you're amazing at sales, but I want to figure out what got you there. What was your background before all this stuff? I know there's like, yeah, so, go ahead. So, uh, sales was, was never something that like I set out to do necessarily. Uh, for me, I, I went to, I went to college, uh, to play basketball, uh, not, not with an end goal in mind really. So, uh, played four years of basketball, learned a ton being a student athlete and then graduated with a degree in psychology and, uh, a minor in business and said, okay, what the heck do I want to do now? <laughs> and so uh, when I graduated, I had a handful of interviews and uh, met with a, a handful of different companies for different positions and, and sort of jumped into a career in sales. Uh, it really, it was a place where um, they throw a phone book at you and say, like, go sell some stuff. And so uh, really difficult industry to, to jump in. And, and what I found was that I was really good at sales. And, um, I found that a lot of my, my background and, and sort of how I've developed as an athlete, um, translated really nicely into a, a career in sales and, um, and it just sort of took off from there. Can we talk about these? Like, what are those attributes that you saw that were very like correlated from whether that's basketball or psychology going straight into sales? Yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing that is is really obvious going from an athlete into sales is competitiveness um and, and that to me surfaces in three different ways one is um how you're competitive uh you know in the course of a deal so like i really want to beat the competitors i want to be the solution that gets chosen or i I don't want them to go with a different uh, competitor, right? There's, so there's that like external factor so of competitiveness. So in the sport, that's like a, a competitor, like a, any rival that you're going to play against. Any a team, team yeah, a team that, that you're playing against or, yeah. And then there's there's another uh, part of it that's like internal competition, right? Which is like, I want to be the best on the team or I want to be a starter, so I need to be better than my teammates. I need to, it's competing in practice kind of thing. And um, in sales, in, in any sales driven organization, you're going to walk in and find a leaderboard somewhere <laughs> and so it's it's that that desire to like i want to be at the top of the leaderboard or i want to be ahead of the, the guy in the cube next to me that kind of thing and then the, the third Jordan. kind of competitive the Jordan. yeah exactly <laughs> we, we still need to have yeah. a competitive list huh? we need to put that up somewhere <laughs> a competitive list. <laughs> yeah. oh we'll get there don't worry cool. we'll get there cool. um, <laughs> and then the third the third thing is, is actually i think the most important piece of this and that's being competitive with yourself and, and so like the, the sort of the mindset of, I want to get better today than I was yesterday, or my goal every single day is that when my head hits the pillow, I want to be better than I was when I woke up that day. Right. And so that takes all of the external factors out of it. To me, that's the most important thing. But if I can come in every single day and strive to just be a little bit better then over the course of time, over the course of 365 days, I get 1% better every time that, that compounds. And so it's that kind of mindset that translated really well from being an athlete into, into sales. Mm. It, it seems like the perfect storm, the, the athlete, the psychology aspect for sales. I, I can't think of like, if you could go back, would you change your majors or would that be do it the same way? Well, no, I, I mean, I, actually, I, I wouldn't change it. Um, I kind of stumbled into psychology because it was interesting to me. Uh, at first, I wanted to be some sort of pre-med or, or something with athletes and, and, and medicine, uh, physical therapy, some, uh, orthopedic surgeon, something like that. I'm not nearly smart enough to do that. So, <laughs> so I, had to, I had to pivot and... Um, you know, I, I had taken a few science classes. So I wanted to stay in the field of science a little bit. Psychology to me was super interesting, like figuring out sort of how people think, what makes them think 
certain ways, the context behind uh, behavior and things like that was was really interesting. And also, uh, it's really, really, really difficult to find a profession where you don't have to deal with people. So no matter what you're doing in business, you're dealing with people. And so as, uh, at least a, a, a basic understanding of psychology is, is to me, invaluable. Um, because, because it's, and sales is, is sort of a prime example of that. Um, it's constantly speaking with individuals. It's a whole, it's communication to the, to the extreme, right? Verbal, nonverbal, especially via all these zoom calls and whatnot, we're losing a lot of the face-to-face interaction that we have. So communication is sort of, um, a hyper important at the moment. Um, because we're not able to build that rapport face to face like we once could. So, uh, that to me was, was super interesting kind of getting all that together. So I, I love the fact that I have a psychology, uh, a degree in psychology. Um, I, I can't do any psychoanalysis on anybody. So I, that, that's a question that some people ask like, Oh, oh no, psychology major. The but, mentalist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you could do a brand yeah. analysis on somebody. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I don't have any superpowers that I'm aware of at least. Uh, but yeah, the psychology major to me is, is if you understand, uh, people and you understand that everybody's unique and there's no, uh, cookie cutter way to be successful at any one thing, um, then, then that's, that's the important thing. It's being able to sort of walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, contextualize, have that perception and, and sort of take those skill sets and, and, uh, deploy them in, in a, you know, a sales aspect. Quite applicable to a lot of different professions, even in design. I mean, that's, that's the role technically of designers to be able to get into somebody's shoes or at least observe what they're doing and kind of analyze where the problems and the solutions lay. And like you said, being able to talk to people <laughs> is, is a huge part of that job. So obviously the psychology background helps a lot. And I'm curious to see how that translates in like real deals, right? The art of the deal, like you said, is a lot of like face to face. So how does that psychology for you, what are those like one or two tidbits, for example, that you notice right away that are really important? Well, I think, I think you can learn a lot from a prospect, uh, without speaking. Right. And so listening skills are, are immensely important and it probably not too dissimilar from a design process. Uh, a really well executed sales process starts with a lot of listening, right? You have to understand who your prospect is and what their pain points are and how it affects the business and how it affects their personal life, even potentially. Uh, and it really, it's, it's asking a lot of questions. It's learning a lot. It's a lot of discovery around the problem and the situation and the context that they're facing right now. Uh, it's not rushing to provide a solution. It's truly understanding where they are, uh, in the, in the process of potentially adopting a solution. And then once you feel like you've got enough information, uh, then it's about formulating a solution to their problem, which, uh, inevitably is going to be our product in a certain way. And, and then delivering that in a way that is meaningful back to the client that says, I've heard you, I've listened, I've heard you, I understand your problem. And here's what we believe. Here's how we believe we can solve it with our, with our software. Yeah, it's amazing. Even at uh, BCG, we had like human-centered designers. I don't know mm -hmm. if you had something yeah. similar at Nike, mm -hmm. but essentially they're basically psychologists. <laughs> they're they're talking to, and then it's it's funny. Like I I had to do a few of these different um, kind of user interviews against focus groups and stuff like that. And you really are just trying to like understand what makes that person like do something or uh, wake up in the morning or and then try to help them as much as possible. It's like listening, listening to what they say, but watching what they do. And a lot of times it doesn't necessarily correlate. And that's oh, yeah. where listening is a huge part. And then observing is a huge part, which and is then trying to figure out like the time. best questions. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. It's like an art form in itself. It so definitely there's, there's so much to be said about sales. And that brings up a really, really good point about sort of what's important in an effective salesperson. And to me, it's one of the, one of the key points is curiosity because it's really hard to fake curiosity, right? If, if I'm, if you're talking about your, your business and your life and your job and, and I'm not a curious person, I can, I'm forcing questions to ask, 
it, that's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to be noticeable. But if I'm naturally curious, I'm like, oh, really? That's interesting. Tell me more about that thing. How how has that affected this over here? Have you done this over there? Um, so that that if you're naturally curious and you can ask those probing questions in a natural way that doesn't feel forced or like you're walking through an interview, uh, like here are the questions that I have to answer you on this discovery call, right? That's what makes it uh, a little more human and a little more effective. It makes it feel like you actually give a crap, which is important in the sales process. I got a curious follow-up question to that. So between uh, the psychology and the, the sports, which one helped you better understand human dynamics and like teamwork and relationships and stuff like that? Ooh. Uh, well, I, I'm going to say sports. And, and I think the main reason is because it was, it was more hands-on experience than psychology was, you know, psychology academically is a lot of reading and applying theories and, and stuff like that. Whereas, uh, you go to a, a basketball practice and you're trying to get the most out of your teammates, for example, um, you're staring at somebody in the eyes and you're, and you're thinking to yourself, how is this person individually going to react if I get in their face and scream at them? Or if I, you know, rah, rah, try to cheer them up and egg them on, what, how do I motivate that individual person rather than, you know, that's not something you can learn in a textbook. So, um, to me that, that was more important, or I should say more influential on my, uh, sort of my career was was my experience as a as a college basketball player. And that's a great tangent. Like if, if you think about it, you're in a sport, right? Or you're on a team, your basketball coach probably has a tons of playbook and plays that he's asking you guys to run. But then the team dynamic on, on the field, on the court, wherever you are, is going to be what takes over, right? So when you're building a sales team, you're going to be able to brief them as much as you want with your sales playbook. How do you make sure like as human to human relationship, they're managing to like apply these playbooks and these techniques, these sales techniques that you're teaching them straight to the to the clients and the sales deals you're trying to make yeah i mean that's a good point because you, you, there's countless examples of of sports teams that are the most talented on paper and don't win the championship or or are not so talented but have tremendous team chemistry or tremendous buy-in to the the style of play or the the coach's playbook and they end up winning right and so like like bill belichick is a phenomenal example and i'm a steelers fan so i'm not a big fan of the patriots whatsoever um, but he's never had the most talented team um, but he has a team typically that buys in 100 percent to that uh mm -hmm. to that style the strategy right? and that's that what makes them successful exactly mm -hmm. so like you have examples of of the new york yankees and the and the los angeles lakers who have these super teams that um sometimes don't win the championship and then so there's this intangible thing that that that's more around how do you build a team around character and and um coachability and desire and passion more so than than uh you know talent level or potential right that's a scary word potential but if if you're if you're building your team with a solid group of individuals who can really commit to the team goal uh, that's what's going to make you most successful rather than having a colle a talented collection of individuals makes a lot of sense do you get mostly inspired by those big goals by like the coaches or other players or on or to, let's let's switch from sports i guess to the sales teams um, is that is it the managers that kind of inspire and kind of give you the why, or is it the CEO leadership? Where where does that why come from? The purpose? Yeah, yeah well, I think ultimately it, it makes a huge difference if you're bought into the the company itself, and so it has to start from, in my opinion, at the CEO level, right? And so the CEO and the the C suite are are, are coming up with a vision and a strategy and a mission. And, and that sort of should drive the entire organization and should be meaningful in some way to every individual. Um, how those, those ultimate, th that, that big picture mission and strategy and vision gets translated to the individual definitely varies upon the manager, right? So like if you're, uh, 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 you know, you take this, this high level mission, it gets turned into a brand 
Um, and then this brand gets turned into marketing assets and a story. And then the individual sales team, uh, individuals on the sales team are going out and telling that story. So it has to start with the, the mission and the vision and the strategy and whatnot. But how that gets sort of deployed on an individual basis is really dependent on the, on the individual manager. So, uh, well, you, now that you're talking about this funnel from, you're talking from top to bottom, right? Or for now you're talking from C-suite all the way down to sales. You're saying technically sales are boots on the ground, right? They're talking to potential future users all the time. So your guys are gathering a lot of you know information, a lot of feedback, a lot of problems, all these things. So how do you get that information back up the ladder, back to the C-suite of, of those people that are technically are leading the vision, but they might not always be boots on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, sales is a job where you really have one KPI <laughs> and it's it's sales, yeah. <laughs> right? It's revenue. revenue. And so I think for the most part, uh, as long as whatever expectations exist are being met, uh, typically C-level C people are less interested, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, great, we're hitting our goals. So uh, what about product teams and marketing teams and things like that? Yeah. So to me, that's an ongoing constant feedback loop and it has to be right. Everybody wants to, for the most part, wants to develop in a, an agile product, right? Where they're taking iterative feedback from the market and they're improving the product on a constant ongoing basis. The only way to do that is to have that feedback loop built internally. So whether that's a, a series of internal meetings on a regular basis where it's like, Hey, monthly, we're just going to sit down and, and share feedback that we've heard. Or if it's, even if it's in a more sort of a uh, quantifiable way where it's being logged by, uh, by, uh, fields in a CRM or something like that. I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it as long as you're doing it. But that feedback to your point has to make it back into the product one way or the other. That, that feedback is so critical for like designers like us to like do innovation correctly, right? Because yeah. oftentimes we'll refine or over-engineer something without really talking to those customers and understanding what, what they're saying, what their needs are. And so it's interesting to see how, like, I guess uh, our, our playbooks kind of kind of help with that feedback loop. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's part of what a sales playbook should be, right? A, a sales playbook should not only tell you how to go sell the product. Obviously that's probably the most important thing that a sales playbook will do, but it also should, should sort of, uh, prepare you for things that you're going to run into and how to collect that feedback and provide it to a uh, product. Right. So inevitably with no matter what product or service that you're selling, uh, there's going to be, um, objections that you hear in the sales process that are legitimate, good objections. Right. And so as those things come up on a more regular basis, as long as we're recording that in some way, shape or form in a quantifiable way, we can provide that feedback back to the design and product team and say, look, we keep hearing the same thing. The, the clients need something that does X, Y, and Z ours does X and Y, but not Z. So how quickly can we implement Z? We've heard it from 15 clients in the last three months and and, and so this is a, a big uh, a, a objection that we're hearing that we're having a hard time overcoming because our competitors do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And this is where like these huge companies like enterprise level clients are usually really good is they've gathered so much feedback. They've built these amazing playbooks that their iteration cycle now becomes smaller and smaller and faster and faster and faster. And so it's really important as company scales, especially smaller companies trying to reach that medium or high or like becoming an enterprise company. They need to build these solid foundations in those playbooks that are connected and interweave between each team. So the story that you're telling from the top down goes through marketing, goes through product, goes through sales, and these playbooks are interconnected. And when they update in one area, the other team should know about what are those latest updates or what are those latest pain points that we're hearing about. When the whole team is at the same page, it makes process just that much faster and that much easier to innovate. Got to get so everybody in the same the exact <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's the exact reason why startups are more agile, right? Is because they don't have it's not an organization of 10,000 people, right? So it's a lot easier for, uh, you know, somebody from sales to walk, you know, 
10 feet across the office and go talk to somebody in product and it not be uncomfortable or be like, who are you? Why are you in my space? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to a different building on campus or a different floor in the skyscraper, right? So that's part of the reason why um, uh, smaller companies can be more agile is because they're, they're having those cross-functional conversations. And in enterprises, that really becomes a huge challenge, right? And so uh, as, as you become a larger company, your, your departments begin to specialize even more, whereas in a smaller organization, you may have a marketing team that does uh, design and user experience and even potentially front-end development and mm -hmm. all these other things. You have different departments in large organizations that f are hyper-focused on those specific things. And so through a, to, to develop a single marketing asset, for example, you may have to engage three, four, five different departments to get that done. Whereas that's one person in a, in a smaller organization. Yeah. The bigger the ship, the slower it, <laughs> it turns, you know, <clears throat> is, is there, is there a trend where some of these big ships are getting really fast at pivoting to like, I'm thinking about uh, the Amazons or the Teslas, but or, they do this through absorption of companies and like stuff like that. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing. I, I'm wondering how they're they're starting to. Is it just that they have so much access to data at this point, and they have so many incredible like systems in place where they are able to ta start taking advantage of these feedback loops that even these startups can't really react to? Or I, I'm curious because like there, there does there does seem to be a trend where like some of these bigger corporations seem to be like wising up. And then where you see like access to a lot of data. So Facebook has a system, mm -hmm. Netflix has a system, all these big companies are building these really, really robust systems to handle this feedback loop. Yeah. But mo I guess 99% well, of think, the companies are doomed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think what, what you're referring to is that um, every single software company out there it's true. is They're starting tech companies. to not just sell their product uh, to get revenue from their product, but they're selling a product as a source of data collection, right? So, so like Netflix is a good example. Uh, you can pay monthly for your net, Netflix subscription, but that's not like the grand scheme, right? The grand scheme is that they're actually collecting data on your viewership behavior, right? And then they can curate specific info, specific shows or uh, series or what they create based on user data, right? And so like that feedback loop is actually built into the product. So they don't even have to talk to people to get that feedback loop. So, and, and other software platforms are the exact same way. They're using, they're using the software platform as, uh, as data collection, and then they're aggregating all that data. So if I have a thousand customers, I, what I have is a thousand different data collection sensors that are constantly feeding back to me and telling me how people are using the platform for X, Y, and Z. And, uh, and then all of that data gets uh, sort of aggregated and then and then algorithms are run on it machine machine learning algorithms and whatnot and then and then they're taking that information and saying we can optimize our product to make everybody a better user or everybody a happier user um, and and we can be able to serve them more things that are interesting to them oh yeah it's a huge trend even down to the micros where like ui and ux designs now are being driven by data like data is telling them this is the best place to put these buttons. This is where people are expecting to see things. This is where the user behavior is. So this is therefore where you should be designing. Yeah. It, it speaks a lot about some some future automation of, of uh, some jobs. But anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> Scary future sometimes. Yeah. Let's not yeah, go yeah. there. <laughs> um, sales playbooks. All right. Well, it's, it's interesting to see how, um, well, some organizations seem to really do care about playbooks. And some organizations... Less so. I guess more, more traditional organizations typically don't have a playbook in place. I, I wonder why that is. As Brian said, yeah. I think the more technology oriented you are, the easier probably it is to build these feedback that's, loops and to gather true. that data. Like a Nike has much harder time because they're, fill, they're selling physical goods, although they're collecting yeah. like kind of who is buying the products in some very loose, rough ways, but um, they don't get the actual like every data that you could get out of a software. So the Google and the Facebook is tracking cr pretty much everything they make is digital. So they, they track every single bit of it. Do you think social has made it easier for salespeople or harder? Like if you if you yeah. if you can like snap a button and then you could be like I, I want to you know be in a world without having to you know compete on social or is is social just such an amazing data collecting tool that you just have to go with it? 
Yeah. So for, for sales, I don't think, I mean, for the impact this has on sales is more around, uh, the amount of information in general that is available to a, a prospect. So, you know, 20 years ago when a, a prospect would come to a salesperson and say, I'm interested, um, it would be like, Hey, I don't know anything about the industry or the product yet, but I'm interested in learning more. Now, today, what, what's happening is if, if you're speaking to a prospect, if they've come to you, it's it's pretty, pretty fair to assume that they've done a, a pretty good amount of research on your company, your product, your competitors, the industry in general. And so they're not coming to you to say, um, you know, I don't know anything about anything. Please teach me what they're coming to you to say is like, we've done our own research and you seem interesting enough to talk to. Um, so I think that's, that's where sales is, is sort of affected by this age of information where now it's like the prospects have access to all kinds of information before they even get to us. And I mean, us as salespeople, we have access to uh, information about the prospects before they even come to us too. So it's a two way street there. So it's like we've 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 sort of creeped on each other on the internet, and now we're finally getting to meet each other for the first time. Where the social thing does have a bigger impact, I think, is on marketing, right? Where uh, I can go out and collect a bunch of information if I have enough uh, followers on social, I can run analysis on on like what my typical, you know, create personas out of my social following and then create advertisements based on my social personas, right? Because theoretically, those that follow you on social are most likely to be your buyers in, in a certain sense. So you can look at uh, demographics, you can look at uh, geography, you can look at um, age, race, all kinds of different things and say, say, here's what a typical user might look like, or here's what this subsection of our, of our followers you, uh, look like. And then say, how else do they consume information outside of Twitter or wherever you're looking? How else, uh, you know, and then that's how you serve ads and what kind of language can we use to, to market directly to these people? So even at, like marketing is insanely data driven right now to, to the extent where, uh, you know, we don't even, we don't even know, right? Like we could talk about a product and then we go look at Instagram, uh, five minutes from now. And all of a sudden you get an ad for it and you're like, Oh my gosh, are they reading my mind? <laughs> uh, and so, so like that, that, it, that data driven approach to marketing is, has gotten like really competitive and really insane. As long as the TV shows keep getting better. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, yeah. that's what I keep saying. Like, if you know what I need before I do, then go ahead and market it to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, let's not be so scared of this. If if you're if you're on the internet and you have a, a connected device, which I'm sure we're all sitting around three, four, five connected devices, then like your information is out there. So use it for the good, not for for evil. But but go ahead and market me the products that I don't even know that I need yet. <laughs> It's tricky, right? You're either one or the other. I, I'm definitely on the side where, like, if I go to the grocery store and they had, like, an aisle just for me, I wouldn't be freaked out at all. I'd be like, this is incredible. You guys are amazing. <laughs> but that, that would drive people wild. Yeah. <laughs> Some people are worried about what they're buying on Amazon, you know? Oh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> oh, oh but God. every time I check out the Amazon homepage, I'm like, yeah, that looks, that looks interesting. It looks like what I want. <laughs> okay. I got to stop going on there. What can you do? Uh... Yeah. So after, after the sales playbook and different things like that, um, uh, wait, actually, so sorry, after, after sports, what was your first job after basketball? Uh, I was a, I was a, a freight broker. So I, I basically sold, sold space on the back of a flatbed truck. Um, so that's I would, gotta I be would tough. Connect yeah. People who had uh, freight to move and the trucks who, who needed, shipments to move uh yeah that was a that was a difficult industry that's the kind of place where they they you know it's like the kpis are you have to make 120 phone calls a day wow. and wow. um you know you're yeah. spending you're spending all day on the phone smiling and dialing and and talking to uh people who can be a little rough around the edges uh especially when you've when 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 they're not happy with you <laughs> Um, so, so that was, that was a learning experience for sure. But, um, but I was, how did you get over it? You must've had a few days. Cause like, I know for me, if I make 10 phone calls in a day, I mean, there's a lot, there's a few ups and downs. How do you get over those downs? Cause with 150, I imagine there's, there was a few days where it was rough. 
Oh yeah. A lot of days are rough. A lot of days are rough, but I think that's, that's what, um, you know, you have to have resiliency. You have to have a positive mindset and it's really easy to just be like, Oh, well, whatever. I'll make another phone call. Um, and even if you're getting like mostly voicemails, if you have that mindset, somebody answers the phone and they catch you off guard. Um, that's not going to be good. Right. So it's, it's really, it's having the mindset that like the next no is only one step closer to the, the, my, my yes. Right. So no's are okay. Answers are okay. As long as I'm progressing, I'm getting closer, but, um, it's really easy to burn out when you're, when you're sort of making that many phone calls and talking to that many people and note taking is incredibly important because it's hard to remember the, all the conversations that you've had, but I can distinctly remember sitting at my desk before my very first cold call ever sweating profusely. <laughs> That's me every and time. I'm like, I'm like, I'm the kind I'm, I'm, I was the kind of guy who would be like, uh, I don't want to talk to somebody on the phone. Can you go call the pizza shop and order pizza <laughs> yeah, for us? Just like, anything's fine. <laughs> yeah. This yeah, is us. Yeah, this whatever. is us before just, filming the podcast every time. Yeah. We're just like, we're, just like yeah. oh. <laughs> we're good. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> True. And, and then like you make that very first call and you talk to that first person and then the floodgates are open. And then you, you start to realize like, Hey, this is, one of the rare professions where if I want to make more money or if I want to go get a raise or if I want a promotion, that is 100% on my shoulders. And, and so like the harder you work, the more you get out of it. And from a monetary perspective, from a career advance, advancement perspective, the whole thing. So that was what was really attractive to me was that I was 100% in control of my career and 100% of my control over my paycheck and 100% control over my success. And there's a ton of external factors that go into whether or not you close a deal or whether how much you sell in a given month or quarter or year. And I, I get all that. But over the course of time, it's mostly based on the level of effort that you put into it and and the mindset and the attitude that you have towards it so that was it i mean it it's not a good answer because there's no there's no silver bullet it's it's tough it sucks but if you have the the mindset that this is a step in my career and i'm not going to be doing this forever and i'm doing this uh, only to learn skills and then graduate onto the next thing then it makes it a lot more palatable so to all any bdr sdr uh, sales entry level sales rep out there who's listening to this or watching this, it gets better, I promise. And you're gonna make a ton of money one day and be like, and look back on the on the time that you spent as an SDR making a hundred phone calls a day and talking to a bunch of strangers and getting hung up on and cursed at and be like, I learned so much. I'm so grateful for that experience. That sounds like the perfect segue into the last topic we're going to cover, which is the <laughs> life at a startup. <laughs> yeah. Right? Let's talk about what is the life yeah. of let's, you. Let's, let's as jump to years where you had to, you know, you got a different job, much, much easier, much more stable. And now you're back into the risk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're back into playing the small, like, five aside team and <laughs> trying to. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, speaking of ups and downs, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. life Talking about startup, great. <laughs> we, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think to, to me, like I, I enjoy building things. Right. And so that, that's ultimately what, at the end of the day, what draws me to a, to a startup, um, you know, being at a, a, a large organization, you know, I could be successful. I can make good money, that kind of thing, but getting out of bed every morning being like, okay, time to go to these same eight meetings every single day and talk to these same 12 people every single week. Um, uh, that gets boring really quickly. Uh, and so for me, like what, what I'm passionate about is, is building something and, and having sort of some sort of pride in what you've built and the progress that you've made. And, uh, it's difficult. There are certainly days and, and you, you guys know this, there are days where you're like, this is never going to work. Yes. Oh my God. What are we doing? We're wasting everybody's <laughs> time and effort. Oh crap. Oh man. It's got, it and hasn't gotten that bad yet. It hasn't done us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, and there are days, there's definitely moments uh, and, then, <laughs> and then there are days on the flip side of that where you're like holy crap like we're gonna make a billion dollars yeah, like yeah. i wonder uh, let me let me go on realtor and see if there are any islands for sale in the bahamas <laughs> like, like there there are those two extremes and yeah. they can happen within 
hours yes. of each other. That's a roller coaster. <laughs> I think that it's, is a it. it's ups and downs. Like I think the most noticeable going from a corporate job to now startup is, yeah. is the ups and downs are much higher and much lower. Yeah, but that's true. overall, definitely worth the 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 ride. That's the adventure you want. You want a roller coaster that just takes you straight. <laughs> I mean, ideally, <laughs> hopefully, just like that one I, I perfect. Know, so there's right? some people out there. I understand. There's some people out there. You want the roller coaster with little bunny bunny slopes, but uh, yeah, we ch we definitely chose a harder path, didn't we? <laughs> well, Brian, yeah, it's, but it's more exciting. It's definitely yeah, more exciting. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Brian, it's been so great having you on. So happy to have you part of the show team. Um, oh, we're yeah. so blessed and lucky to have Brian on the team. Yeah, we're, he's helping us out so much on the sales yeah, front. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah. Thanks for another great podcast. Thanks for being here. Yep, thank you. Thank you, yeah, Brian. Pleasure. For thank everybody you. watching, yeah. please uh, let us know what you thought. If you have any questions for Brian, I'm sure he'd love to dive in the comments yeah. and answer everybody one by one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you have any ideas for future shows, anything else you want to hear about the brand and startup world, hit us up, let us know. Subscribe, like, do all the good things. See you next week.